Here, bud. No, he has to say here. Yeah. Representative Agello. Here. Representative Batista. Here. Representative Bennett. Yeah, here. Representative Caldwell. Present. Representative Casimiro. Present. Representative Corvese. Present. Representative Felix. Present. Representative Lombardi. Representative Noray. Here. Representative Place. Present. Representative Roberts. Present. And Representative Bella Wilkinson. <laughs> Twelve present, three absent. We have a quorum. Oh, somebody has a baby. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, welcome to the House Committee on Judiciary. Today is Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. Uh, we have uh, 18 bills here tonight, one to vote on and 17 to hear. Um, I'd like to uh, handle the uh, bill that we're going to vote on tonight first. Uh, but uh, I see Representative uh, Chairman Bennett had uh, a little friend on there. Uh, <laughs> He's what is your first lawyer. This is his first. Uh, someone you told me he took him. out papers to uh, to run against you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Someone told me he took out papers to run against you. <laughs> I'll tell you, he's going to run for me when I get to vote. Um, I think that. Uh, Representative Knight and Representative Lombardi are now present. I am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So, the first bill for consideration is House Bill 5394, uh, sponsored by Representative Cortrevand. It's an act related to state affairs and government, preserve, preservation of families with disability, disabled parent act. It precludes yeah. a parent, dis, parent's disability from serving as the sole basis for the state to institute an investigation of the disabled parent's family. It's uh, a great bill. I move passage. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Yes. What is it? Chair? Yes. I just want to say also, it's a great bill. The, we've had this uh, two, three times in front of us, mm. and the testimony is always rip your heart out, heartbreaking. Yes. And, um, I'm glad we're taking care of this problem. All right. Do you have a second? I have a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, no, I'm sorry. You're going to do a roll call. I apologize. Oh. Oh, back to roll call. Yep. Chairman Craven. Aye. First Vice Chair McEntee. Aye. Second Vice Chair Knight. Yes. Representative Jello. Aye. Representative Batista. Aye. Representative Bennett. Representative Bennett. D David, turn your microphone on. Representative Get Bennett. Out. Oh, there he goes. He's on. Yes. Yes. Okay. Representative Caldwell. Yes. Representative Casimiro. Representative She's Casimiro. Julie. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Representative <laughs> Corvese. Yes. Representative no. Felix. Yes. Representative Lombardi. Uh, I'm present, Mr. Chair, and I'm voting yes. Representative Noray. Yes. <laughs> Representative Place. Yes. Representative Roberts. Yes. And Representative Bella Wilkinson. The ayes have it, Chairman. Okay. Now we'll move on to the calendar. There are 17 bills to be heard uh, for hearing and or consideration. Uh, as is our tradition, with bills that are being heard for the first time, we hold them for further consideration so that we have an opportunity to digest testimony and work on any flaws or language correction that may be helpful as a result of the testimony given before this committee tonight. So with that in mind, do I hear a motion to hold all bills for further consideration? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call vote. Yes. First Vice Chair McEntee. Aye. Second Vice Chair Knight. Yes. Representative Agello. Aye. Representative Batista. Aye. Representative Bennett. Yes. Representative Caldwell. Yes. Representative Casimiro. Yes. Representative Corvese. Yes. Representative Felix. Yes. Representative Lombardi. Yes. Representative Noray. Yes. Representative Place. 
Yes. Representative Sorry. Correction, no. Representative Roberts. A. And Representative Bella Wilkinson. The ayes have it, Chairman. Okay, the first bill we'll hear tonight is House Bill 5985, sponsored by Chairman Solomon. It's an act related to insurance, specifically Rhode Island Title Insurance uh, Insurers Act. This bill provides that only Rhode Island attorneys can act as a title insurance agent and determine the insurability and marketability and that would be of the title of the of the home or the building that's being sold or the land it limits the discount title insurance premiums uh, and restricts sharing premiums chairman solomon the floor is yours thank you mr chairman and members of the committee uh, mr chairman you did a great job explaining this bill um, this bill really is the result of uh, uh, a few years ago, the Unauthorized Practice of Law Committee had transmitted three reports to the Supreme Court concerning three separate matters regarding the unauthorized practice of law, and specifically in regard to, uh, to uh, individuals acting as title insurance agents and the uh, insurability and marketability uh, in determining the insurability and marketability. Um, although the Supreme Court um, had a mixed decision on this, where they had held that, uh, that the title insurance companies and their agents do not engage in the unauthorized practice of law when they conduct a real estate closing, residential real estate closing, draft a residency affidavit, and draft a limited durable power of attorney, uh, so long as those activities are carried out in connection with the issuance of title insurance, they did say that they concluded that with respect to conducting the examination of title for marketability, a title insurance company may do so only if a licensed attorney engaged or employed by the title insurance company conducts the examination. So this bill uh, codifies the marketability section of that decision, but it also, it's a consumer protection type of bill. Um, for the most part, the consumers need to be protected when they're go, go entering a closing. And although these title insurance agents uh, do a great job with what they do, there's a certain, it, it's very important that if there's a question that comes up, a legal question, currently the, those individuals will not be able to answer it to, by interpreting the law and giving them uh, proper legal, legal gu guidance. They would have to step out and uh, revisit it and obviously delay the closing. And the thing is, Rhode Island would not be alone uh, if this bill were to pass. Currently, Connecticut is an attorney-only state. Uh, in addition, you know, we always talk about what's Massachusetts doing. Massachusetts is also an attorney-only state in that regard. So, you know, I think it's a great bill, and uh, you know, I look forward to hearing the testimony today in committee. Any questions of uh, Chairman Solomon? Thank you, Chairman. Um, we're going to uh, call. Sure. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, John. Uh, John Labardi's got a question for you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. How are you? Good. Uh, uh, Chairman Solomon, how are you doing today? Excellent. Thank you. Good. So, uh, so let me ask you a question. I know what you know what cyber crimes and things of that sort and uh, uh, identification theft. Uh, and we know the banks and lenders are concerned about that. So how do we protect the borrowers with this? How is the borrower, uh, the mortgagee, uh, protected with this, if you don't mind me asking? I'm sorry, the, how, how are the borrowers protected? Yeah, the borrower, yes, yes. Well, I mean, it's just so, having legal counsel available yeah. to answer See, any questions. I guess more my concern is, Mr. Chairman, is that, you know, sometimes, you know, you, I mean, I'm not, I don't do closings, but sometimes, you know, you got lawyers there, they're representing the title company, the bank, the, you know, the buyer, the seller. And to me, there's like, you talk about a, 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 a cornucopia of conflict sometimes. You just wonder. Uh, does this try to uh, level the playing field at all? Or uh, does this make this... Does it keep it as complicated as it, as it always is? I'm sorry, I'm getting a little feedback with the echo in this room. Um, but I mean, the, so, the, the, sometime, 
the attorney does have a fiduciary duty and responsibility to whoever they would be providing advice to. So yeah. um, I, I think there would be some experts that would be testifying on this that can give you a better answer on that. Yeah. Yeah, it just it oftentimes you know you go some you know somebody prepared the doc, somebody else is doing the actual closing, someone's representing you know, and you just wonder there's dual purposes, and you just wonder, like well, who's the fiduciary duty to? Is it the actual mortgagee? Is it the bank? Is it the insurance company? But anyway, okay, I can ask that of somebody else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Lombardi. So I was <clears throat> indicating uh, that. Uh, we're going to have, on this bill, we're going to have one person that's going to kind of carry the ball for the opposition and one person that's going to carry the ball other than the uh, sponsor for, um, <clears throat> for supporting the bill. So I'll go to, uh, if you guys don't mind, can you take the third person down and the last person down in that order on that list, if that's possible? J James O'Donnell, Esquire, and Rebecca Cox, attorney at law. That, Um, hello? Yes. Hello. Is it Jim O'Donnell? Yes, sir. Jim, you're on the air. Can you turn down the volume on your computer? Will do. Thanks. <clears throat> am, I, am I ready to go? You are ready to go. Uh, well, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, members of the committee, uh, thank you for your time and attention uh, uh, this afternoon. My name is Jim O'Donnell. I'm the president of Equity National Title. We're a Rhode Island title agency formed over 30 years ago, which today employs 140 people, 93 of whom are Rhode Island residents. We conduct title agency business all over the country, and I have uh, formerly served as a director on the board of Rhode Island Mortgage Bankers and uh, still uh, sit on the legislative committee. Um, I do not, I am testifying on behalf of my company. Um, our company is one of, one of many, mem one of the many, one of the members of an industry-wide coalition signing on to Amicus Curiae Brief in the recent Supreme Court for Unauthorized Practice of Law that uh, Jim and Solomon mentioned. I'm also a licensed title agent in Rhode Island and dozens of other states across the country, and importantly, a Rhode Island attorney. I oppose this bill for a number of reasons, all of which you will find in my detailed written testimony, which was submitted earlier. In not passing this bill, the General Assembly would follow its 20-year history of rejecting like-type bills as well as affirming the, Supreme, the recent Supreme Court decision. This bill replaces the definition of title agent with a Rhode Island licensed attorney. As a result, it will make Rhode Island just the second state in the nation, which the Chairman Solomon may mention of, with an attorney-only title agent model, second in the nation. And more importantly, and more significantly, it will eliminate hundreds and hundreds of title agents and the jobs that go with them, the very jobs the state is trying to keep in attract. We're a financial services company. We employ 140 people with above national average salaries, in short, very good paying jobs. The very jobs we want to bring to Rhode Island. If passed, this bill would imperil our business by preventing us from doing business in Rhode Island, and more importantly, in eliminating our Rhode Island license, we lose the license and reciprocity in other states, which puts our business in grave jeopardy. Further, if this bill passes, we'd have to view Rhode Island as an unfriendly business environment and have to consider, reconsider a long-standing commitment to Rhode Island. I've been a Rhode Island resident for all of my 62 years. But ours is not the only business that would be affected. There are currently over 1,100 licensed agents in Rhode Island. By my count, about 25% are attorneys, meaning over 800 will be impacted more than half of which are Rhode Island-based agents and their jobs with them. There's also the ripple effect to consider on scores of contract attorney employees, attorneys, notaries, as well as ancillary businesses to support us, lost, the lost title agent licensing fees, and lost tax revenue. I respectfully say that it's foolish for the General Assembly to be funding efforts to recruit companies with financial services jobs in good pay. At the same time, we're eliminating them through protectionist legislation. Passing this bill would confer a monopoly on a well-off, already well-off, you know, real estate attorneys and send a chilling message to Rhode Island businesses that they're not welcome here, uh, that their business is not valued, only that of in insiders may be. It would also send a damaging, contradictory message to the out-of-state companies being pursued by commerce. 
Why would they come to the state if it's, an, if it's in fact an unfriendly business environment? Forcing the elimination of hundreds of businesses and jobs while creating a monopoly in its place for no compelling reason, with all due respect, meets the very definition of an unfriendly business environment. In fact, it raises a fair question. How much harder will you as legislators in the state have to work to replace the jobs lost and overcome a newfound reputation of being unfriendly to business? Second, this bill would be very harmful to Rhode Island consumers in a number of ways. The bill would eliminate competition. It eliminates consumer choice. It creates a monopoly and increases custom consumer costs while also not improving services, not providing a compelling consumer protection in exchange for closing an open marketplace. But decades, lenders as well as consumers have benefited from being able to choose from hundreds of agents and able to insist on the most competitive pricing and service levels in doing so. Lenders who buy title services and refer their customers to title providers, be they agents or uh, uh, non-attorney or attorney agents, and their customers would lose in a closed marketplace. But far greater harm to consumers though, would be in the higher cost they bear. In our brief to the Supreme Court, we pointed to data which showed closing costs in attorney-only states averaged $250 more per transaction than that of non-attorney states. This translates into close to $15 million more that Rhode Island consumers would have paid on last year's transactions. There were 60,000 or more transactions last year in Rhode Island. In addition, Rhode Island currently has the second lowest closing cost in New England, and converting it to an attorney-only state would put it in the top three, if not the top. A $15 million increase in consumer costs would benefit just a few dozen and harm tens of thousands of consumers. Third, the reality is this bill is, is defining the practice of law, something that lies in the sole jurisdiction of the court. The court rendered a unanimous decision upholding decades-long practices of non-attorney agents closing real estate loans. By defining a title agent as only being a licensed attorney, this bill defines the practice of law, which means they've ignoring, it's ignoring, frankly, it's ignoring the Supreme Court decision. The court's sole authority to define the practice of law is not disputed. And in the Supreme Court case, it was not. In fact, some propo proponents that you'll hear from, perhaps, promoters of this bill have even said that. Here are their words. Quote, because this code has, court has exclusive authority to define the practice of law, legislative enactments that address the issue must yield to the court's authority. That was from a brief from conveyancers who signed on to a brief uh, um, in, uh, in the court. This court alone has the authority to declare what is the practice of law in the state of Rhode Island. That's from the brief from the Connecticut Attorney's Title Insurance Company, which is a promoter of this bill. So based on that and based on you know, the court, it's settled. The court makes the determinations, and it's settled. Certainly the case determined that. Evidently, that authority, what governs practice of law, has been forgotten, and now the proponents are back in the legislature asking for an outcome they themselves have asserted is not for the legislature to give. They've also forgotten the legislature's claim to give this outcome to them five times since 2002. And uh, frankly, I think we should be rejecting the argument of people who, have, in effect, are contradicting themselves. Finally, there's been no showing of the compelling and actual harm to consumers by non-attorney agents needed to justify the radical outcome this bill would invoke. None. If this legislation passes, the result would be to remove competition, remove consumer choice, raise prices, all of which are very harmful to the consumer. To justify this kind of radical action, there would have to be a showing of actual harm to the consumer by non-attorneys providing title services. There has been none. In fact, the absence of any evidence of consumer harm was cited by the court in the case as yet another reason to not overturn decades and decades of non-attorney closings. In fact, they called the harm that was testified to by uh, the other side theoretical and not actual. Finally, it's important to note that the Supreme Court cases were generated from a lawyer complaint, not a consumer complaint. There's been no showing of consumer harm in the court's case, and then two folks, who, two, company, two, uh, two briefs, uh, briefs re uh, made reference as rationale for opposing the possibility of, uh, of, uh, of the court finding a, uh, in practice of law. This is what they said, and I'll close with this. Without, without a finding of actual harm or the reasonable probability of harm, rules for unauthorized practice of law can be used to protect lawyers from competition rather than to protect consumers from incompetence. That's from uh, the Rubita Scurry brief of Consumers for a Responsible Legal System, a consumer advocacy group. Lastly, Without a sh actual showing of a showing, I'm sorry, without a showing of actual harm, 
restraining competition in a way that is likely to hurt Rhode Islanders by raising prices and eliminating consumers' ability to choose among competing providers is unwarranted. That last quote was a direct quote from the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission's brief in the Supreme Court case looking back at their opposition letter in 2002 to another bill that was very much like this that essentially would have had the same impact. Their words ring true today, 20 years later. I believe that the legislature should follow their own 20-year precedent and at the same time honor the court's authority and decision and decline this give to give this bill any further consideration. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your attention. I am happy to answer any questions members may have. Thanks, Jim. Any questions for Mr. O'Donnell? See, oh, uh, John Labardi. John. Hey, Mr. Chairman, how are you, Mr. O'Donnell? Uh, very well, Mr. Uh, Representative. Thank you. So I just, I have a, a series, just small questions, small answers I'm looking for. In, in a, a sentence or two, why, why was it rejected over the past 20 years? Can you, could you summarize that for me, please? Well, uh, I believe that the, the arguments weren't made. I think that there's, uh, the legislators were troubled by effectively creating a monopoly of, you know, of, of attorneys. Um, and, they, you know, we've been at it. I've been testifying. This is probably my sixth time testifying before the judiciary on this very matter. Um, I, I think why we're in there, frankly, is because of competition. I think that the, 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 the quote that I just mentioned, this is about you know, a competition. It's not, frankly, about practice of law. It's about competition. It's a feeling that, you know, uh, 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 a lot of conveyancing attorneys feel that they're not able to keep up with the times and keep up with the demands of, uh, of the business and, you know, uh, come to the legislature for legislative uh, intervention. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell, without a lot of legal ease in maybe a sentence, why did the Supreme Court rule against it? Could you make it, you know, uh uh, unloyally as, as you possibly can, please. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'll try my best. Um, yeah, well, they that, found that's that me, by the way, Mr. O'Donnell, not for anybody else. I'm the one who doesn't understand, so I guess you can. Uh, so in, in the decision, um, Representative, uh, they made it clear that the practices for decades and decades and decades uh, have, uh, you know, were safe for the consumer. There was no finding of consumer harm based on how pr pr uh, transactions had occurred. There was some statutory uh, authority for that as well, there was in, and uh, there was just no finding of any harm for the way things were, um, and, and there was no reason, no compelling reason to make a change. And by the way, it's a radical change, and like you know, it's a rather radical change, and there'd have to be a finding of compelling harm, none, none shown. You know, I believe that that's why they they uh, they, they declined to uh, uh, they, why they upheld it. Was a unanimous decision, by the way. I have two more questions, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind. Uh, you, you indicated there will be uh, 1,100 agents uh, affected, notaries, lawyers. Yeah. Any idea, a guesstimate, how many jobs could potentially be lost? And any idea, because you indicated something about lost tax, tax revenues, can you give a, a guesstimate, a guesstimate again? You know, we'll be held, yeah. we'll be held accountable either way. Yeah. Any idea? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I, I would, I, I mean, my estimate, you know, we've got 140 jobs. I can speak to that. They put them in peril. And if every single one of those folks, those 800 or so, represents a job, then there you go. Do the math. It's about a thousand or so. I think you're going to hear testimony from people today who, you know, who would, who would, who would, uh, support that. A, B. Um, you know, I'm sorry, uh, you know, I, I, I failed uh, accounting. My dad was an accountant. I failed accounting um, uh, representative, so I can't do the tax revenue math. But there's gotta, it's got to be significant. We know also that the, the license, uh, the license, uh, the lost license revenue is a little over $100,000 every two years. And my last question, same question that I asked uh, Chairman Solomon, that is, uh, we know that banks and lenders are concerned about cyber risk and privacy. Uh, what do you do to protect the borrowers against hacks and, and yeah. cyber? Any, any idea how to deal with that with, with regard to this yeah. legislation? Yeah, I'll try to, well, I'm not sure with regard to legislation. I can tell you what we do to protect the consumer. Well, first of all, we, we, we're, you know, we're, our, our emails are all secure. Uh, we have an extraordinary investment in technology to make sure that uh, we're protecting the consumer from, um, from hacking and risk. We have a cyber protection policy of $3 million, which covers the consumer, uh, the hacking risk, identity fraud, uh, you know, et cetera. Uh, we also test our website with what we call penetration testing to test it constantly to make sure that, you know, it can't be hacked or it's invulnerable. 
We've got extensive information security controls on our business. We have to because we're handling borrower data. And, you know, our, our domain is, 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 is our domain. We know with all, you know, we know that there's a lot of practitioners in the business that sit on, on Gmail and Yahoo accounts. In fact, in my, in my letter, you know, I made reference to that, that there are, with all, you know, unfortunately, there's, there's some attorneys who, their business accounts are on Gmail and, and Yahoo. And, and that's, those are the ones that are most vulnerable to a hack. We, I, I want, lastly, once a week, I'm sorry, once a day, I get a phishing attack. You know, so we, when we see, we suspect that, we do training of our people to make sure that we're not getting hacked. I mean, we, you know, we've got a lot of borrower data. We not only that, we have borrower money. So we're, 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 target for, we're target for the hackers. And I think that we've got significant protections in place to protect the consumer. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah, and and said very quickly, any idea why this bill keeps coming up if, you know, the Supreme Court has ruled, you know, uh, against it or, you know, the law of state, state? state something yeah any idea why it keeps coming up yeah i i think that i i, I mean i respect the the um um you know what the chairman you know stated about codifying marketability you know there's a lot of you know there, there's there's a lot of you know marketability you know we don't need to we don't need to codify marketability the court stated what it was uh, what they, they define marketability. You know, all title agencies work with attorneys who will determine marketability when marketability needs to be determined. Marketability isn't always the, the standard. There's an insurability standard. Frankly, if all transactions are subject to the marketability title, uh, the marketability standard, it would be cost prohibitive for transactions to be, to be handled. And the court also said that as long as an attorney is determined marketability who's engaged or employed by the, by the law firm, I mean, sorry, by the agent, it was permissible, so there's no need for 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 the, the codification of, of of the marketability standard, uh, none none whatsoever. And by the way, that conforms with practices in about seven or other states that we are active in, where an attorney will issue an opinion of title to the title agency, and the title agency will still ensure the transaction. I have, in, you know, my submitted in my written testimony a map that illustrates that. And, 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 and uh, you know, uh, the chairman um, and the chairman mentioned uh, um, Massachusetts. Well, Massachusetts is a certification of title that's necessary in a purchase money loan by an attorney, not in a refinance transaction. So that, 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 that picture that I provided will spell out how other states manage it. Rhode Island would be unique. Uh, well, Rhode Island would be unique um, along with Connecticut in having a title attorney, title agent having to be an attorney. Other states allow for an attorney to be engaged by the agency and to be paid by the agency, employed by the agency, and determine marketability and still issue policies. So Rhode Island and Connecticut would be outliers there, but frankly, the minority of all jurisdictions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. I appreciate it. Thank you, Representatives. Any further questions of Mr. O'Donnell? Just one. Oh, Jason. Mr. O'Donnell, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Can you give us the site of that uh, Supreme Court decision, if you have it handy? Um, well, it's, uh, I think it's 218-161-MP. It's, it's, a, it's a consolidation representative of three cases that came before it from uh, the, United, uh, the Unauthorized Practices of Law Committee. Can you just, it's can, can, you, can you just slowly recite that so, citation? I'm sorry, slowly? slowly. Yes, sir. Um, two, two, 2018 hyphen 161 hyphen MP, and the second case is hyphen 162, the third case is hyphen 163. So let me repeat that back, make sure I got it correctly. 2018 dash 151 or 161? I'm sorry, I have a heavy Rhode Island accent. Um, uh, the one, no, 161. Then 162, then 163. <clears throat> Hyphen NT, November Tango. And, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, uh, Mary Paul. Again, my Rhode Island accent's getting in the way. Thank you. Any further Thank questions you, of the witness? Thank you, Jim. The next witness is uh, Rebecca Cox, who will speak for the Rhode Island Title Council uh, and in support of the bill. Hello? Turn up.
Um, let's not leave too much dead time. Let's go to the first witness, Megan Jones. Ro 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 oh, oh. Here you go. Oh, is this Rebecca? I am. Rebecca? Okay, okay. How are you? Good evening. I'm good. good. How are you? Good. You're on the air. Good. You can testify. Thank okay, thank you so much. Uh, good evening. My name is Rebecca Cox, and I am the managing underwriter in Rhode Island for Connecticut Attorney's Title Insurance Company, known as CADIC. CADIC was created to promote the role of attorneys in real estate transactions. CADIC is the largest bar related title insurer in the nation. We have an office in East Providence and annually issue thousands of title insurance policies that protect the interests of both the consumers and lenders in Rhode Island. I'm here today to urge you to adopt House Bill 5985. I have been involved in the real estate industry here in Rhode Island for 20 years. I am familiar with all aspects of real estate closing and the important role that an attorney plays in that transaction. We at Caddick believe that consumers are benefited when they are represented by Rhode Island attorney title agents when they are involved in the most expensive and important transactions that they will enter throughout their whole life. Rhode Island attorneys play a vital role in looking out for the interests of the consumer and making sure that all things are done and documented correctly. Recently, the Rhode Island Supreme Court had an opportunity to opine on what is the practice of law in Rhode Island. The court made it clear that only Rhode Island attorneys can determine the marketability of a title and the quality of that title. These are jobs that should be only performed by Rhode Island attorney title agents. For many reasons, including the size of its Rhode Island, the size of Rhode Island, it is very common for out-of-state large corporate agents to try to take business away from attorneys licensed to practice law in our state. These efforts by out-of-state actors take needed business away from Rhode Island attorneys. This bill would make it clear that those important title agent functions can only be performed by Rhode Island licensed attorneys who are put in a unique position to make sure that title is conveyed correctly. There is a final provision of the bill that I would like to discuss as well. One of the ramifications of these out-of-state actors taking business away from Rhode Island-based attorneys is that for large commercial transactions, many out-of-state entities will offer to lower the, the title insurance rates to a point where it is unprofitable for a Rhode Island attorney to be engaged in that business. This downward pressure on rates artificially lowers the receipts from the premium tax enjoyed by Rhode Island. I urge adoption of the legislation. Thank you for your time and consideration. Any questions of attorney uh, Rebecca Cox? Yes, Blake. Thank you, attorney Cox. A quick question on page four lines 25 through 33. Um, is that the downward pressure you were talking about where there is the potential to have reduced rates for homeowners? Um, it is not with regard to the reduced rate for, for um, homeowners. Um, what it is in regard to is um, the amount that we are allowed to collect in premium. So it would be a certain dollar amount per thousand for large commercial transactions. So this would be an instance where you have um, a shopping plaza or things of that nature. Um, I work with my agents to get them a rate that is both beneficial for them and for their client. Um, but we have instances where national companies, I'm not speaking to local Rhode Island business. Um, I am speaking to large national companies based elsewhere um, who come in and essentially take these transactions away from our local Rhode Island attorney agents. So, so the issue is the competition is the problem with out-of-state companies coming in here and offering better rates? Because it seems like... Undercutting, undercutting Rhode Island for that piece of it. Yes, that is true. That's one piece of it. And so when you have an out-of-state company coming in and, as you put it, undercutting, some others may say offering a better deal, well, wouldn't this language hurt the potential homeowner because now they can't get a better deal on their title insurance? No, it, um, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. It's two separate issues. So one is a, a commercial setting. Um, and that is the downward pressure to which I was speaking. For the homeowner, 
it only benefits them to have a local Rhode Island attorney involved who knows the practice here in Rhode Island. Our homes are our biggest investment. Um, title insurance is a one-time investment in your home that protects you for the duration of your home ownership. And God forbid an issue arise, you want to know that that attorney evaluated the issue, properly insured it, and that you'll have peace of mind for the duration of your home ownership. So that only benefits the consumer. Okay, thank you. Representative You're Place, welcome. you have a question? Yes. Um, so you just said that you're, you're worried about the risk of a homeowner being somehow harmed because they're not using a lawyer. Um, is there any examples of that taking place? I think someone had said this is, this is a decades-old practice. Can you provide any um, examples of where that's actually happened? Or are you just saying, I, I have a piece, can. I'm still, I, still asking the question, thank you. Or are you just saying um, that, um, okay. are you just saying that I have a piece of paper with a law degree on it so I can do it better? Oh, absolutely not, sir. No, I would not say that at all. But I do think that the perfect example is found in our Supreme Court decision regarding um, real estate and the unauthorized practice of law, where there was a transaction. It involved um, definitions of tenancy and a probate situation, and it was not identified, which caused um, a delay in closing, which, as we know, can have ramifications for the consumer. It can affect their interest rate lock, lock things of that nature. Um, it can cause them to go into a rental for a period of time where they would suffer loss. All I'm saying is that an experienced attorney with legal training, bar admissions, um, you know, uh, ethical oversight, um, malpractice insurance, they're in a position to both identify issue spot problems to avoid the risk altogether, but then heaven forbid an issue arises, the appropriate coverages and protections are in place for the consumer. But has it actually happened? Yes, sir. And I think um, if you were to look at the um, decision out of our Supreme Court, um, that decision provides the example to which I just spoke. Any further questions of uh, Attorney Cox? Yes, Jason. Actually, no, it's not. Uh, it's, I don't have a question. Okay. Um, seeing no further questions from the members, uh, we'll move on, move on to the next witness. Before we do that, though, can I oh, just... You uh, can make a comment, jump sure. In? Sure. So, um, yeah, I think it's important to know in this committee that a law degree is not a piece of paper. <laughs> it's borderline insulting to suggest that it is a piece of paper through the chair. Lawyers exist to navigate a world which is unknown to the regular person and to do so in a way so that they don't create some harm in their own lives or are somehow protected from the sharp edges and the sharp elbows of the law. And you need only go into the library over there to see how, much, how many sharp edges there are. This case that's been brought up here, 2018-161-MP, 162-MP, and 163-MP is a long one. I pulled it up, and I'm just working my way through it. But I think, it's worth this, I think it's worth to repeat or read into the record from the opening paragraph by unanimous per curiam decision by our Supreme Court. In our judgment, right, in our judgment, allowing such transactions real estate transactions, to be conducted by non-attorneys exposes sellers and especially buyers to the possibility of harm that outweighs the one-time savings that a party might realize as a result of not having to pay a fee charged by an attorney. In our view, pursuing such a course of action is fraught with peril. However, that's not the question before us. What is before us is whether a non-attorney who performs one or more various services that are associated with a real estate transaction is engaging in the unauthorized practice of law, and they go down the list. I'm interested to see how it all turns out, but there are three specific examples in there of people who are not attorneys who are doing shady, shady stuff, borderline holding themselves out as attorneys or inducing people to forego their legal rights in a way that attorneys cannot do, 
because we have a fiduciary duty to our clients, such that the entire unauthorized practice of law committee referred this case up in all three cases and said, declare real estate transactions attorney-only areas right now. The Supreme Court declined to pick it up, right? It sounds like it was a close call. I'm sure it is after I read this. But lawyers have an important job to do in society. And jokes aside, it is one of the three original professions, clergy, medicine, law. We've been around for thousands of years helping our clients navigate those sharp edges. And I hope that the members of the committee understand that, Mr. Chairman. Blake. So through the chair, yes. um, I agree with most of the bill. I'm just concerned about page four, where it says no title insurer may reduce or discount the amount of title insurance. Why would we be preventing that type of competition? So everyone has to use an attorney. I agree, we should have attorneys, but why are we saying that an out-of-state company can't come in here, use local counsel, and offer better rates or offer discounts? I, I don't know why we're preventing that type of market force. I, I'm, I'm, Mr. Chairman. Per perhaps Mr. Knight could tell us. Sure, go ahead. I, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm, this is not my area of law, and there are a ton of ins and outs of insure in in real estate law. I mean, it's the kind of thing I look at, and I get a little cross-eyed at how complex it gets. So I'm not speaking to the merits of the bill. Um, I know that our Supreme Court thinks that attorneys ought to take care of it. I think the the bill will figure it out through the through the testimony. Uh, I sponsor. I was a co-sponsor on this because I think it's worth having this, the discussion. Dave. Mr. Chair, I just wanted the record to reflect. My comments were on the argument being made, not on the profession of attorneys. As I interpreted the argument, the argument being made was, I should be able, the attorney should do this because we have the law degree, the piece of paper. That was the, that was the argument. It's an argument I disagree with. It was not a reflection on the entire law profession and those that would, who hold judicial, their, their degrees in law. It was a comment on the argument being made, and from my standpoint, the argument only was, it should only be a lawyer doing it, and I just happen, obviously, disagree with that opinion. So if someone took offense to the comments, I apologize, because it was not a, an attack on the profession of law. It was an attack on the argument as I heard it. Mr. Chairman, that's very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think that's all the questions of uh, Attorney Cox, uh, the next caller is whom? Robert Smith, okay. Robert, welcome to the House Committee on Judiciary. You've got a, you've got a minute and a half to testify, Robert. Robert? Hello? Hello? Robert. Yes. You're welcome to the House Committee on Judiciary. You have a minute and a half to testify. Okay. I, a minute and a half for my remarks? Yes. Perfect. That's about what I have. Thank you. Am I on right now? Yeah, you're on now. Go ahead. Oh, great. I uh, appreciate the time the committee has provided to hear comment on... Uh, on Bill 5985. Uh, good evening. My name is Robert J. Smith. I'm president of Solidified Title and Closing based in Middletown. We're formerly known as Linear Title. We've been operating in Rhode Island for over 15 years. Solidified provides title and settlement services for home purchase, refinance, home equity, and default transactions to mortgage lenders in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. As of March 31st, we employed over 200 Rhode Island residents. We're in opposition of this bill since it would narrow consumer choice, inhibit competition, and unnecessarily raise the cost of a real estate transaction for Rhode Island residents. Secondly, it would impose an unreasonable standard on long-standing title and settlement practices commonly used in Rhode Island um, in the vast majority of the, of the rest of the jurisdictions of the United States. Relative to higher consumer costs, the House Judiciary Committee should not prohibit title and settlement practices that are commonly used in Rhode Island and most other states that have been for years without any measurable detrimental effect to the public. Such a ban would impose significant additional costs 
on Rhode Islanders for certain activities that are largely routine in nature and do not require a high degree of legal skill and judgment. For many years, these activities have been performed competently by non-lawyers in Rhode Island without any harm to the public. We therefore do not believe it will be in the best interest of Rhode Islanders to incur additional costs in connection with real estate transactions and no meaningful benefit. According to data collected by the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, there were 32,000 uh, plus real estate transactions completed in Rhode Island in 2019. Though the precise impact of the dollar impact of this bill is difficult to estimate using the amicus brief filed in connection with the Balkan Supreme Court case, we estimate uh, that that increased cost would be $240 transaction or over $8 million per year before considering the cost, uh, additional cost to the seller side of those transactions. Robert, you've got 15, Robert, you've got 15 more seconds. Okay, great. We appreciate it. The Rhode Island Title Insurers Act is substantially unchanged since 1992, except to the extent it was modified by the Balkan decision. The proposed bill would, in essence, overturn the Balkan decision by restricting title insurers uh, in the state of Rhode Island as licensed attorneys. Um, we, do not, uh, we do not believe that this practice has been proven detrimental nor provide otherwise adverse interest to the public, therefore no consumer harm. In conclusion, we respectfully oppose this bill and sincerely appreciate the time the committee has afforded us to express our opposition. Thank you, Robert. Any questions for Mr. Smith? Seeing none, next witness, please. Is this Michael Crone? This is uh, I'm sorry? No, th this, is, this is Ben Pettit. Oh, hey, how you doing? You've got a uh, minute and 30 seconds to testify. Okay. Um, well, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my testimony today is given on behalf of uh, the Rhode Island Mortgage Bankers Association, who strongly opposes House Bill 595, um, the proposed bill seeks to eliminate corporate title agents by amending the definition of title insurance agent um, to uh, include licensed attorneys in Rhode Island only. This amendment encroaches upon practice of law territory. Uh, the apparent justification for this change is the insertion of the words and marketability next to determines insurability under the definition of acts performed by agents on behalf of a title insurer. It would seem the purpose of this language is to create an inextricable link between insurability determinations and marketability examinations in the issuance of title insurance policies. The two are fundamentally different concepts. Title insurance companies are in the business of insuring title, not guaranteeing it. This is an important distinction. A, a marketable title examination is to certify or guarantee, if you will, that title is free of all defects and unresolved interest dating back to the root of title, uh, which in Rhode Island is established as of a date 40 years prior to the time of marketability is being determined. On the other hand, an insurable title determination is one in which the title insurance companies are willing to insure over known or in quite often unknown defects and unresolved interests. Uh, while a marketability examination necessarily requires a search back to the root of title, an insurable title determination does not um, the notion that an attorney's examination of title for marketability is an essential element of writing title insurance is largely based on the fiction that a root title search is being done in every transaction. A long-standing practice in Rhode Island, has, as has been established and authorized by the various title insurance companies, involves the use of starter policies and shortened search periods for the purpose of establishing an insurable title, wherein a, title, a, a determination of marketability is, by its very definition, impossible. And more to the point, the purpose of any policy of insurance is to provide coverage against the, against the risk of a future loss. What all insurance policies share in common is that they are contracts of indemnity. They are not guarantees, and this is no different with respect to title insurance. They provide coverage in the event of a loss, subject to the policy terms, conditions, exclusions, as outlined in the insurance contract. Benjamin, they do not guarantee Benjamin, loss. Benjamin, you yeah. have 15 seconds to finish, please. Okay. Well, finally, um, the, SJC, the Rhode Island SJC already heard and settled this matter in this decision last year. It, it, it largely upheld the provisions of the Rhode Island Title Insurers Act and century-old practice of non-attorneys handling real estate transactions. The proposed bill is really an attempt to circumvent the, the SJC's exclusive jurisdiction over issues concerning the practice of law through Legislative Act 
RIMBA respectfully asks this committee to respect the SJC's decision and its exclusive jurisdiction with respect to issues concerning the practice of law and to reject this bill. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions of the witness? Seeing none, next witness, please. Michael? Yes. You're on the air. You've got a minute and a half to testify. All right. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Michael Crone. Um, I stand in uh, today in opposition to uh, House Bill 5985. As I stated in my written testimony, I've been a practic uh, practicing attorney since 1979 and I'm currently practicing in Rhode Island and in Massachusetts. For 40 years, I have specialized in real estate transactions. I speak as an attorney in opposition to this legislation and frankly, any legislation that seeks to protect lawyers from legitimate competition. I have owned and managed law firms and title companies that have conducted tens of thousands of real estate transactions. I have served as special counsel and state manager the first American title insurance company for Massachusetts. And with that background, I can tell you today that the determination of insurability and the issuance of title insurance is not the practice of law, an opinion shared by your Supreme Court and the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, among other states. Title insurers throughout the country have courted and embraced non-attorney title companies as agents for decades. Why now does this bill seek to restrict these agencies to only attorneys? Protectionism is never a consumer-driven reason. If this bill is passed, what comes next? A bill that requires that only attorneys can prepare the Rhode Island Association of Realtors standard form single-family purchase and sale agreement that realtors prepare today? Or a bill that allows that only attorneys can research titles in the city and town recorder's offices? Or perhaps a bill that mandates that only attorneys can record deeds? This bill puts Rhode Island on a slippery slope and one that is tilted against the interest of the consumer. If I thought that having only attorneys as title agents would benefit anyone but the attorneys, I would say so. But as an attorney, I will tell you that it does not. 15 seconds, you have a Mike. System, 15 thank you. You have a system that has worked very well for over 100 years. There's no consumer groundswell for change, no serious issue to address, no multitude of legitimate complaints against title companies to compel this form of action. For these reasons, I respectfully ask that the committee reject this bill. Thank you, Mr. Uh, attorney uh, Crone. Any uh, questions of the attorney? Seeing none, next witness, please. Hello, you're on the air. Who is this? Could you give me your name? <laughs> My name is Laura Swenson. Laura, can you turn down the volume on your computer? Yes, I've turned it off. And you have one minute and 30 seconds in order to be able to testify. Okay, and when will that start? Now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Laura Swenson. I'm an attorney admitted in Massachusetts in Rhode Island. I have been a resident of North Kingstown for 18 years. I respectfully am in opposition to the passage of this bill, and I do not believe the title agents need to be only attorneys. While its intent, the bill's intent may be consumer protection, the outcome of the bill is not. This bill, if passed, will have far-reaching consequences on Rhode Island consumers. I am a manager of a, the New England retail team at a title company, and I'm involved with closings across New England. I have personal knowledge in regard to which states have higher closing costs. Across the board, as one can imagine, states requiring attorneys to complete parts or all of the settlement process cost the borrowing consumers significantly more. If this bill passes in Rhode Island, on average, consumers will be charged 40% more in settlement fees. This will restrict and sometimes completely prevent certain borrowers from closing on a loan. I have conducted a number of closings and been at the closing table and seen first-time home buyers who cannot come up with their cash to close, increasing settlement costs to the borrowers can prevent people from being able to purchase their home or to refinance to get a lower rate to make their overall payment more manageable. This bill will directly harm Rhode Island consumers. In addition, Rhode Island real estate attorneys are already overburdened with the volume of closing loans. 
deactivating title companies as agents will force more attorneys into the field of real estate without proper experience and training. There is more oversight required of title companies. Laura, 15 seconds. Yes, thank you. There is more oversight required of title companies than attorneys. And in conclusion, I just want to draw everybody's attention to my written testimony. Title companies are subject to at least a dozen audits each year of escrows, policies, procedures, and practices with regard to title and insurance. The title company I work for is SOC certified, all to best practice certified. We carry professional liability insurance of $5 million, crime insurance coverage of $3 million, and data breach coverage of $3 million. A typical law firm carries $1 million of professional liability. Law firms are undergo um, scrutiny only when an allegation is made requiring an investigation by the bar committee, as opposed to title companies that routinely have to have their transactions audited, reviewed, and approved. For that reason, I respectfully submit that I am in opposition of the bill. I hope that you uh, are persuaded to oppose it as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next witness, please. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Carmela. You want your uh, presence and vote recorded. All right. Next. George? George? Hello, George, are you on the air? Nope. Let's go to the next one. Yes, sir. Oh, George, okay. You've got one minute and uh, 30 seconds to testify. You're on the air now. George, you're on the air now. Oh, okay, all right. Next. What happened to him? They disconnected. George? Yes. Yes. Hello. Okay, George. One minute and 30 seconds, and your time starts now. Sure. Can you hear me okay? I can. Go ahead. Thanks very much. Um, uh, we've been employers in the state for 20 years, we've invested in our communities. Um, we are Lincoln Appraisal, uh, Lincoln Abstract and Settlement Services. Um, there are really two essential issues going on right here. The unauthorized practice of law is the first one, and I think that's been put to bed by the uh, Rhode Island Supreme Court. The Rhode Island Supreme Court, hello? You're still on the air. Oh, I'm sorry. The Rhode Island Supreme Court uh, ruled that, uh, that it is not the unauthorized practice of law to have title companies um, handle residential real estate closings. Um, moving forward to this year's agenda, there seems to be no empathy towards the hundreds of Rhode Islanders who would become unemployed if not attorney title companies were unfairly driven by the market. Um, this lobby because uh, the, the, the lawyer lobby because uh, the unauthorized practice of law failed at the Supreme Court level has now changed tactics and now they want to uh, corner the market uh, and name title agents as attorneys only. Um, as founders of this title company, uh, we've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in the future of our company and our employees. We don't feel that the attorney should get a special carve out against companies like ours. We've done nothing wrong. wrong. We've cumulatively employed hundreds, advanced and enhanced the quality of pricing and transactions for consumers. Um, even the Rhode Island Antitrust Act attempts to stamp out with great George, 15 by seconds. By eliminating, um, restraint of trade by eliminating monopolies, trade, commerce, etc. I hope that we don't get driven out of business. I'm trying to boil down three minutes of testimony into a minute and a half, so I apologize very much about that. Um, but we see this as, a, as an unfair monopolization of the practice, and uh, we would certainly have to reevaluate our business model if this were to pass. George, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, next witness, please. Hello, you're on the air. Please state your name, and you have one minute and 30 seconds to testify.
Hello? Turn, turn down the volume. Uh, please, st please state your Hi. name. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dan Balkin from Balkin Title and Closing in Warwick, Rhode Island. Dan, you have uh, one minute and 30 seconds to testify. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Balkin Title was opened in 2016. Uh, I currently employ 13, uh, well over the national average in uh, pay compensation. Um, I currently have two attorney staff and had three up until the middle of February of 2021. I've had an attorney uh, helping uh, work with Balkan Title since its inception in 2016. Uh, the second part, uh, the Supreme Court in May of 2020 obviously passed a decision. Uh, after three years in testimony and hearings, uh, they gave a clear verbal and written opinion and decision on more than a 100-year uh, act, the Title Insurers Act. Uh, which they clearly identified what areas of the act needed to be addressed, and I feel like they did that very well. Uh, more or less the economics of how this is going to really affect everyone. Um, how many companies would this put out of business? Rhode Island residents, uh, companies like Equity that also uh, responded today, Linear and SoFi, Liberty Title, and hundreds of Rhode Island employees left without jobs. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, one of the main things we see from an economic standpoint, uh, you know, how do we stay afloat during the pandemic? Um, these are things that we've had to take into, into serious, uh, I would say, consideration when owning a company. Um, you know, and from an economic standpoint, you know, a lot of our companies all took out PPP loans. We took out personal loans that uh, we needed to keep our companies alive and to keep our families fed. Um, so. I think from a standpoint of looking at it, how many commercial leases, how many landlords, how many, who repays all the personal guaranteed notes on these PPP loans or loans that companies have taken out to upgrade their systems, upgrade their technology, cybersecurity. We have so many regulations uh, that are forced against us that we need to go ahead and protect our companies. Dan, Dan so. you have 15 seconds to finish your testimony, please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, uh, I am uh, not for the bill uh, that's being uh, offered. Um, I'd like to see it uh, passed upon and uh, take into consideration of the overall uh, Supreme Court ruling that was presented back in May. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next witness. Next witness. Hi, welcome to the House Committee on Judiciary. Please state your name and you have one minute and 30 seconds to testify. Good afternoon, my name is Jennifer Johnson. I am a Rhode Island and Massachusetts practicing attorney um, and I currently work as the Executive Vice President of Lincoln Abstract. Um, I am going to take what I have written and thrown it out the window because I only have a minute and a half and I wanted to focus on one, uh, one item. Uh, the main item that I want to focus on to make sure that everyone in the committee understands um, is that although there are corporate title agents, corporate title agents employ attorneys. Um, at my office, we have a team of attorneys. We also have a team of title examiners, a team of closing specialists, paralegals, bookkeepers, all of the like. All of those professionals make up the title agency. Lawyers do perform all of the tasks necessary and important and vital for an attorney to perform along the way in the process. We review title for marketability every day, all day long. We consult with borrowers, with lenders. There's a host of things that we as attorneys that are all part of corporate title agencies um, do. And to make a general redefinition of a title agent to be an attorney only to make sure that certain tasks in the closing process is done by just attorneys is the wrong way of going about it. Um, I, will, I will stop at that except add one more thing. The also, the other thing that I really would like the committee to take under consideration is that um, post-COVID um, and prior to COVID, uh, consumers are doing closings in a different, very different way. Um, and they are demanding and are looking for uh, technologically advanced closings. They are looking for digital closings, electronic closings, hybrid closings. Um, they want a different closing experience than what has been tradition. If we were to pass this 
fail, we would be taking five steps back because the technology would not be available and would not be the same if only attorneys were title agents. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm available for any questions. Any questions for Attorney Johnson? Seeing none, next witness, please. No more witnesses? All right, that concludes testimony on House Bill 5985. I see Representative Speakman here. So I'll, work, I'll do her bill next. It's on page two. House Bill 578, uh, 5728. Uh, it's an act related to state affairs and government and Department of Safety. Authorize the state police to provide retention slash storage of municipal police officers' body camera footage. The floor is yours, Representative. Thank you, Chairman. This bill comes to me at the request of the um, police chief and what, what's on? Good. Thank you. It, this comes to me at the request of the Warren Town uh, Administrator and the Warren Police Chief. This would um, require the State Department of Public Safety to store and fund the footage from body-worn cameras for police officers. As we know, the Rhode Island Police Chief Association in their 20 for 2020 reforms committed to body-worn cameras. And, uh, but the research suggests that this is actually more expensive than folks uh, anticipated. Uh, the police chiefs anticipate that it would cost $3 million to purchase cameras for all officers statewide and $3 million more to maintain and store the footage gathered in the cameras. That's about $100 per camera per month. And for small departments like the town of Warren, that's a burden, uh, fiscal burden that they are going to have a hard time bearing. So this simply assigns to the State Department of Public Safety the uh, storage and funding of storage for the uh, body-worn uh, cameras. And there may also be economies of scale if it's done statewide as opposed to town by town. Thank you. We have any questions? Any questions to the sponsor? Yes, Doc. Representative Speakman, wh where is this stored now? It's stored in the cloud. Uh, should uh, departments have this? It, the, the com there's one company, Axon, and it's uh, all sto it's stored in the cloud. Uh, okay. It, Wherever it, that is, Doc. I don't know where that is. But. Okay, so it's not stored in every individual municipality. Yes, they have to have an account in the with through the company that owns the camera to store it in the cloud. But the the municipality, as far as I understand it, the municipality is the one that has the account for the storage and pays for it. So they're all stored in the same place? Yes. Well, it, they're all stored in its cloud-based storage. Oh, okay. And the departments have an account with the company. Okay. As so, I understand it. So now you want to switch it to? The state. State police would maintain the storage and pay for it. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Jason Knight. Uh, through the chair, question. Yes. Um, Rep Speakman, uh, if the state was the one customer for Axon, it seems like we might get a better deal on the, on the cloud storage and we might get a better deal overall if, yes. if there was just one outfit they had to deal with. Is that, is that part of it? That's part of the idea, yes. All right, thank you. And we do see, by the way, that some de police departments, Arlington, Virginia, I think my research indicates, has actually had to cancel their, uh, they can't afford to pay what it costs to store the, the footage. So they bought the cameras and discovered that the storage is actually more expensive than they anticipated, so they canceled the program. So, Representative, please. How long are they storing the footage for? I mean, is this something they have to maintain indefinitely? Or is there a time frame that this... I believe that, that the Department of the State, the Department of Public Safety would um, determine the policies for storage. How long do you keep it, right? That would be up to them, which I think is what the individual departments do now. Representative Felix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Rep, just a quick question. In terms of your research, have you found out in terms of how many accounts are alluded to, allotted to each municipality when the state uh, has a contract with the with the cloud agency? I do not know the answer to that. Sorry, I can find that out though. Okay, right, thank you. 
And again, this came to me basically um, as a sort of, not exactly an objection to an unfunded mandate by the state, but just that this is something that the police chiefs committed to do in their 20 for 20 reforms and the local departments are having a hard time um, finding the room in the budget to pay for it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I, I work in public records, so I wanna you know, keep mindful that um, in terms of being able to access, each, each municipality being able to access the record is extremely important, so that's why I ask. It's important yeah. to know if um, who will have access to that if, and if it's only a specific uh, person or account right. for each municipality that it's um, thought through, just because again, if, if um, under the current public records law, right. we only have a certain amount of time to, to provide records, right. and if there's a bureaucracy around access to those body-worn cameras, then it may create some issues around the APRA. Uh, from what I APRA. know, from what little research I did in advance of this, is that the, the Secretary of State actually has regulations uh, regarding access to this information, um, but whether it works well or not, I can't really comment on. It's a good question. Any further questions of the sponsor? Yeah. Carol? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Speakman, are they trying to store every single piece of film that comes off these cameras, even if it was an uneventful in incident? Mm -hmm. I can't answer that question. I actually don't know how the, the gathering and the storage works from the mm. police department's um, perspective. This is, again, more about paying for it rather than how right. all the system works. I apologize for not knowing the answer to that. Well, no, no apologies necessary. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. I know some departments around the country have had to revert to saving things on um, CDs because they, the cloud is so expensive. And right. that obviously has uh, storage issues if they're... The cloud is always telling me I have storage issues. <laughs> I, I don't know what to do about that, but it does keep trying to sell me more cloud space. That's right. So I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any uh, further questions of the sponsor? Yes, David. I just, just personally, it's not, not necessarily the sponsor, just in general before we go to the people testify. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, if the state's going to take this cost on, you know, what is it? I'm trying to figure out, it is paying for a certain number, certain gigs, where however many, tar whatever they're using now, you're paying for X amount of space worth of data. And I'm trying to figure out, they're not, the cost for data storage isn't necessarily outrageous. So I'm trying to comprehend why it is, unless their, in, their intent is to store the data in perpetuity, in other words, every single minute, every single second of film from now until whenever. I just don't understand how this can be unaffordable for a local municipality because data storage isn't necessarily that expensive. Mm -hmm. And I just, if we could get more, I would like to see more information on we'll get you know, that what the cost is, what their policies are and things like that. Okay. Any further questions of the sponsor? Seeing none, thank you, Representative Speakman. Thank we you. have one witness on this bill, Randall Rose. Randall? Yes. Uh, could yes. you turn down the volume on your computer? I'm doing that right now, yes. Thanks, and you have one, one minute and 30 seconds to testify. Thanks. I'm in support of this bill. I, I agree with the rationale in terms of saving money. I wish it was more specific. Um, the, um, it's the, we do not necessarily have to store the information, as Representative Blake said, we do not necessarily have to store the information with Axon, who's the, the company that owns Taser and provides the body cameras. We, um, there are um, other cheap alternatives for storing data, and the um, videos should be available for at least as long as the statute of limitations on a lawsuit. Um, and the... Um, but I do think that there, and there, but I do think that it's a good to um, tra to save money by transferring it to the state police. Um, and I think the policy making um, should be transparent. There should be um, public hearings about the policies that are made because it's a very sensitive issue. It affects issues of life and death. Um, if these data is too destroyed too easily, I would want to make sure it's stored in a place that has good reputation for keeping um, data and maybe even have backups of it, um, because uh, but the worst thing is if the body camera video is lost in a crucial 
case, um, under, even if it's under, whether it's under suspicious circumstances or not. So I would prefer this to be more specific, but as it stands, I do think the bill is an improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. There are no questions for Randall? Not, I don't have a question, just oh, comment? Add okay. something to the record. Um, just so everyone knows, uh, uh, right now only Providence and Newport have body cams. Uh, they run, uh, Axon is the vendor. And the storage issue is not so much a storage issue, it's what the services that Axon provides is stem to stern data reliability. Um, from the time that the image is captured on the camera, uh, on the officer's chest uh, to its storage and then passing through a chain of custody to be used in court someday, they can provide, my understanding is, is that they can provide the chain of custody that is required in a criminal case. Um, so it's, 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 yeah, sure, it's cloud storage, but it's also all the extra safeguards that go into effect um, when you're talking about evidence. Uh, I don't know how long they keep that stuff. I imagine they have a sort of one year, if it's not called upon, get rid of it, uh, or deep store it somewhere. I'm sure it's very complicated, but it's a, uh, I, I don't think it's a matter of just dialing up a couple blade servers on Amazon Web Services, so for what it's worth. Thank you. Any further questions on this bill? Seeing none, then that concludes testimony on uh, Representative Speakman's bill, which brings us to Representative Kislak's bill, she, I believe, yes, she's still on, uh, on remotely. It's an act related to uh, health and safety, protection of children, physical sex characteristic surgery act. It prohibits physical sex characteristic surgery for children under 12 years of age, except to address an immediate physical harm. Provides for a private course of action for violation with a 10-year statute of limitations. Representative Kislak, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. I'm pleased tonight to bring before you for your consideration Bill 6171, which would prohibit for specific surgeries on children before they are able, before they are old enough to make decisions about their own bodies and their physical sex characteristics. This bill will preserve bodily autonomy for children with physical differences until the child is old enough to participate in important decisions about their gender and what their bodies should look like. This bill will prevent the permanent harm on psychological well-being that can happen when parents and doctors make gender-related decisions for their children who are born with physical anomalies that do not fit solidly into our um, binary sex characteristics and that, they, that parents and doctors can't make these decisions before the children are old enough to participate. We should be supporting and promoting patient-centered care, and that's what this bill does. It puts decisions about non-medically necessary surgery off until the children can meaningfully participate. This bill does not impede on any surgery that is necessary for the medical well-being of children. It is an issue that I didn't know a lot before. I'm learning a lot, as I know you will tonight as well. I'm looking forward to the testimony. This is clearly a very important conversation to have here in the General Assembly and more generally. I'm committed to making sure that we're getting this right for Rhode Island kids. It's really important. In so doing, I think it's especially important to listen to folks who are intersex about what their interaction with the medical community is and has been like and what will support them and the kids who are coming up now. I will leave the introducing of the details of this bill to the experts, including Bria Brown King from Interact, who is a subject matter expert. We also have doctors, legal experts, and other people who will talk about their personal experiences. So with that, I'll pause for questions, but with a caveat that our subject matter experts are coming up to testify soon. Thank you, Representative Klezak. Any uh, questions of the sponsor for members of the committee? Hearing none, we'll move on to our f first witness, which is Bria Brown King. Hello, Bria, are you with us? I am, yes. 
Uh, welcome to House Judiciary. Um, you have the floor. Thank you. Hello to the members of the committee. My name is Bria, and I'm calling in strong support of HB 6171. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm calling on behalf of myself as a person with lived experience. Uh, I think the bill is pretty straightforward. It says that surgery to reduce the size of a clitoris, create a vaginal opening, uh, remove working gonads, or move a working urinary opening are all surgeries that can and should wait until the child is at least 12 and able to meaningfully participate in the conversation. And just to note, some of us who were born with differences in our physical sex characteristics mm -hmm. identify as intersex, but others don't. Um, but people should have uh, the right, their rights to bodily integrity protected, whether they identify as intersex or not. Passing HB 6171 would mean that Rhode Island is taking a step in the right direction towards a future where children get to participate in the conversations happening about their bodies, because ultimately they are the ones uh, that would have to live with the repercussions, not their parents and not their doctors. I truly believe that fear is the main reason that these surgeries are forced upon us. Uh, and for me and for many of my intersex peers, I think that our parents and our doctors fear that we'd grow up and not be, quote, unquote, woman enough or man enough based off of their own kind of harmful assumptions about the correlations between sex and gender identity and about what normal bodies are supposed to look like. And also, these surgeries happen because of the assumptions we make about our children the moment uh, we learn that we're pregnant. Uh, you know, we wonder what the sex is going to be. We have our two binary lists of gendered baby names, and we start to imagine all of these different gender scenarios, like having tea parties with our daughters and teaching our sons how to play basketball. And we just uh, get so attached to this idea that there are only two possible ways to exist, and we build our entire lives and our entire identi identities around this false assumption. But what often gets left out of that is the fact that it should be clear by now that people don't belong in boxes, and that includes children. Um, there is no parent here that could make me that could make me believe that forcing a child to undergo a cosmetic procedure like the ones outlined in the bill is not done solely to force that child to fit into some sort of box of gender norms that society prepared for them. It should not be a requirement to have a vaginal canal constructed because the parents and doctors assume that that's what the child would want, uh, would want when they grow up. The parents and doctors should not be assuming that the child will want to have penetrative sex one day. It's also so common for doctors to tell us that we need to have these surgeries in order to have sex with our husbands in the future. But no one is asking us what we want. No one's having conversations with us about our options, including the option of not having surgery. No one's telling us that there are people out there who haven't had surgery who grew up to live healthy and fulfilling lives. Why is it that parents and doctors get to decide how we want to use our body parts? This bill reasonably asks that these procedures be delayed until the, ta and, until the child is at least 12 and can hopefully at that time better understand the risk associated with surgery. Thank you, Bria. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next witness, please. Uh, hello, welcome to House Judiciary. Could you please identify yourself? And you have one minute and 30 seconds. One minute and 30 seconds. <laughs> I'll try. Uh, okay. My name is James Mills Barbeau. I'm a physician. I practice, uh, I'm the dir director of laboratories at Lifespan Academic Medical Center. Um, but I'm here uh, representing myself, not Lifespan. Um, th there are fundamental issues at, 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 at I can't really imagine uh, uh, a more important, um, a more important uh, issue to have to grapple with and to get right because we're talking about children. 
Uh, and the question, to start with the question, do children have a right to bodily integrity? And, and I think it's self-evident that they do. So the question then comes, do in, intersex children have a right to bodily integrity? Do they have the right to be protected from surgical alterations on their healthy bodies? Um, there are, as a, as a physician, I know there are many biological pathways that can lead to being intersex. Uh, each pathway is actually in many ways beautiful in its own right, and, and uh, vanishingly few intersex conditions actually pose a danger to the child. It would be more appropriate to think of intersex as part of nature's di diversity, uh, bringing a boon to the world in a much-needed perspective. Um, in that light, it becomes clear that we are not here really um, to protect children intersex children from being born intersex. Instead, we're here protecting children from the danger posed by us uh, changing their, dis their genitalia. And the, uh, the practice is, okay, um, are you interested in hearing a bit more? Yes, yes, doctor, please proceed for, try to wrap it up, and then we may have some yes. questions. Okay, go ahead, proceed, I'll be happy doctor. To do that. Thank you. Um, it started with, uh, in the 1960s, uh, the children um, were, uh, uh, intersex children, were, they, their, their phallus, their, their, their penis was being measured and the clitoris uh, was being uh, decided if that was acceptable. Um, and, you know, do you cut off the clitoris? Do you amputate the penis? Um, it was all based on a man named uh, John Money at John Hopkins University um, who asserted that he'd learned that in the first few months of life, you can m teach somebody to be a boy or a girl. Um, and uh, it, it, it was basically, you look between their legs uh, in, in, in real life and, uh, you know, they drink, uh, dress in pink or blue, uh, they're called he or she, and if you... Uh, are able to um, get them indoctrinated uh, within the first few months of life, then they'll be happy and they'll be in the right gender. So uh, the trick was to operate on them uh, as early as possible to get that, uh, that process started. It has been completely um, uh, dis uh, discredited. And in fact, uh, uh, John Money uh, sensationally uh, turned out to have been a charlatan. Um, these days, we're still doing cosmetic surgery that's unnecessary and dangerous. Um, there are many, many uh, uh, consensus statements that still are grappling over the idea of whether we should be um, uh, mutilating uh, in infants' genitalia. Um, and... Uh, you know, a person's janitor identity is, has been proven now to be innate and stable. Uh, whichever gender, uh, gender identity you have, you, you're going to keep it for your life. And that's true Doctor, for intersex children. Doctor, yes. if you don't mind, we have a question from one of the members of the committee. Uh, he's been looking at me for a while, so I, I think I want to stop you before you continue. Um, Very good. Uh, Chairman Corvesi, please. Good evening. Hello. I'm going to ask probably some very simple questions on the very complicated, uh, what appears to be a very complicated and a very important issue. Currently, before this type of surgery would take place, would there be genetic testing done on the child to determine the traditional binary characteristics? Yes. Yes. There are multidisciplinary teams now. There's been some evolution going forward, and there are uh, there's genetic testing. Um, there are, is is a very thorough attempt to determine what um, pathway caused the uh, infant to be um, intersex. The, the problem is that we still, even if we know what their um, the way they got to be intersex. We can't possibly predict how they're going to want to be in, later in life. 
Um, and that's why so, there's so much surgery. And, 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 mm -hmm. I, and, and I think that wades into a different area. I just was curious from a, uh, a uh, surgical standpoint before they, they um, uh, took any steps, if there was a genetic testing done to determine what the uh, binary characteristics of the child were. And you answered that. You said, you said huh. the answer is yes. Yeah, a fantastic uh, question. And the answer is yes, but we still don't know how to predict. Well, and that goes to the second part of my question. Yes. Why 12 years old? I, yeah, I, I, I sort of had the same idea. It really is um, my, my impression um, and my best guess is that it has to do with giving as pr protective a window as possible. Um, oh. There is, if you can keep, if you can have a, an intersex child grow up to the age of 12 without being molested, uh, okay, then stop. that person... Stop, stop, mm -hmm. stop. Excuse me. Let, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's take a, a step back. <laughs> and I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to uh, uh, truncate your testimony. Sure. Let me just say, when you say when you take an intersex child, and again, I may not be familiar with the actual definition, but are you talking about an intersex child from a physical standpoint or an intersex child from a gender identity standpoint? No, no, this is all biological. Okay. Uh, what we're talking so you're about talking, is 100%. You're talking, you're talking about a phenotypical intersex child. Exactly. It, it, exactly. Okay. It, it is not, it, it's not uh, transgender that we're talking about okay. at all. So, so you're, okay, so you're not, you're not wading into a gender identity situation. That's absolutely correct. We're Good. not. Okay. So I guess that does beg the question, why 12? Why 12 years old? Yeah. I think I think that uh, by the time you're you're 12 years old, you start to be able to uh, express who you are, um, and, uh, and 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 the uh, ability to um, if you don't if you don't stop the process early and just let them get to fruition, um, the uh, you're going to have a lot of the issues determined just by interacting with the child. But uh, I would prefer it to be um, more protection, even to uh, you know, 18 years old, becoming an, an adult. But I think that's really what there is a difference. You know, you get to you get toward in, uh, um, uh, at puberty, and uh, you know, you you sort of are able to understand your body a little bit. Um, I, I would have preferred it to be a, a, a higher age, frankly, okay. to be protected. So you talk about oh, what, what I think one of the last, the last speaker was mentioning was the fact that, um, and, and I think you're alluding to it also, is that around 12, uh, are, you, are you talking about the uh, initiation of puberty, or are you talking about the initiate, initiation of sexual self-awareness? You know, I actually, I actually, I don't, I can't really answer that question. I wasn't part of the drafting of this, and then when I when I knew that I was coming up next, I turned off the uh, uh, the background noise, um, and so I really didn't know what. You were discussing uh, about about the age of uh, adolescence. But, well, I, but I I think I thank you for your testimony. I I, I just wanted a couple of questions answered uh, regarding this uh, going forward. And uh, thank you. I sincerely appreciate your uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you, Chairman Corvesi. Uh We have several doctors that are coming on, Chairman. Uh, after this that you might be able to answer your questions as well. So if there's no other questions of this witness, thank you, doctor, for your testimony. Uh, we'll take the next witness, please. Question, I wasn't part of the Hello, welcome to House Judiciary. 
Yes. Uh, please turn down your computer or television or whatever you have. And okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Okay. Please yes. turn it off. Is yep. probably the best bet. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the House Judiciary. Um, please identify yourself, and you have one minute and 30 seconds to testify. Please proceed. Thank you. My name is Liza Aguiar, and I am a pediatric urologist with Brown Urology and an assistant professor of surgery and pediatrics at Brown Medical School. I'm representing myself, the pediatric urology faculty at Brown, and the Society of Pediatric Urology. Thank you for allowing me to speak today in opposition of this bill. Although I believe this bill was written with good intentions, I'd like to take the time to explain why those of us who take care of intersex patients oppose this bill. I'd like to first point out that the definition of intersex changes depending on who you talk to. For the purposes of this testimony, I will use the NIH medical definition of intersex which is limited to those conditions in which an individual's chromosomes are inconsistent with the individual's genitalia, or conditions in which the appearance of the genitalia cannot be classified as male or female. You have heard that nearly 2% of the population is intersex. This number is not based on the medical definition of intersex. A more accurate prevalence is about 0.018% of the world's population. This much lower number is borne out in our experience at Hasbro Children's Hospital where we have carried out zero surgeries for intersex over the past five years, partly because of how rare these conditions are and partly because we already do recommend delaying many of these surgeries. I'd also like to emphasize that how we take care of intersex patients today is radically different than how we cared for these patients 30 years ago. Based on the current intersex guidelines, surgery is often delayed. In addition, it is standard of care to approach these patients in a multidisciplinary fashion. At Hasbro, our patients are cared for not just by a surgeon like myself, but by a team of specialists including endocrinologists, geneticists, pediatricians, ethicists, social workers, and psychologists. Patients and their families are fully informed and supported from the day their child is born. It confuses me that neither the legislators who are sponsoring this bill nor its advocates took the time to ask us the simple question of how intersex patients are managed at Brown and Hasbro. Instead, they assumed we have not changed our approach in over 30 years. It is wrong for anyone to assume that we do not take a patient-centered approach, that we have not listened to and learned from our patients, and that we have not changed as a result. The language used by the proponents of this bill paints a picture of physicians mutilating, abusing, and scarring children. This is incredibly inaccurate. I'd like to point out that the American Medical Association Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs recently spent almost two years evaluating how we currently approach the care of intersex patients, carefully considering all sides, and they rejected the suggestion for a moratorium on surgery. So some have questioned, what's the harm in waiting? This bill states that all genital surgery that does not pose an immediate risk of physical harm should be delayed until the patient is 12 years of age. First of all, it is not safe to delay care until a patient is in crisis or there is an emergency. It is not safe to wait until the patient has infections, kidney failure, an obstructed uterus, or cancer, as this bill proposes. It is clear from our research that there are some instances in which early surgery is the most medically sound course of action. Many of us have been asked if this bill could be modified to limit specific surgeries. I really wish I could just say yes and provide you with a list. But unfortunately, that is impossible. First, a surgery that is completely inappropriate for one patient may be exactly what another patient needs. Another point I'd like to make is that one fear of mine is if a bill like this passes, my patients with private insurance and the financial means will seek appropriate care in another state but my patients who do not have the financial means 
will have to wait until their 12th birthday, which is exactly what is happening at Boston Children's Hospital, where families with means are being referred out. Although I cannot support this bill for the reasons I've stated, I would be more than willing to discuss alternative ways we as physicians can regain the trust of the intersex community. A little over a week ago, I asked to meet to represent with Representative Kislak and Senator Mack to discuss an idea that advocates in Nevada working with pediatric urologists came up with. It's the idea of an intersex board, which would include members of the medical community as well as members of the intersex community. This board would meet to establish local guidelines of care to review specific patients in a HIPAA-compliant way. The board's recommendation would be included in the medical um, chart of the patient. I believe this approach will achieve the same goals as this bill intends to accomplish without the unintended harm. It provides full transparency to the intersex community, which I think is very important, and I hope we can join Nevada in this effort to providing the best possible care for intersex patients. Thank you for listening. I look forward to continuing this discussion outside of today's hearing. Thank you, Liza. Uh, any questions of this witness from the members of the committee? Uh, Chairman Corvese. Good evening. Thank you for your testimony. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, so I had uh, asked the previous witness about uh, genetic testing uh, prior to surgery. So I, I am going to assume that that's performed here? Absolutely. There's genetic testing performed. Um, it's one of the first steps in diagnosing patients with intersex, yes. And that is taken into account? Yes. Um, the whole um, the genetic testing uh, imaging, including ultrasounds and abdominal x-rays, um, everything is taken into account, yes. Um, and I guess the other question I wanted to ask was the age of 12 years old. Is that problematic? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I have seven-year-olds who can make better decisions about their bodies than some of my 17-year-old patients. <laughs> I don't know where 12-year-olds, the 12-year age cutoff um, comes from. Uh, I think that there are some patients who can make decisions about their bodies way before that. I think this is a very individual case-by-case -case situation, and individualized care is uh, extremely important. Thank you. Thank you, Liza, for your testimony. Uh, next witness, please. Good evening. Uh, if you could please turn your computer down. Welcome to House Judiciary. Please identify yourself, and you have one minute and 30 seconds to testify. Please proceed. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Sylvan Frazier, Senior Staff Attorney with Interact Advocates for Intersex Youth. Uh, we are proud to support House Bill 6171, as it will safeguard the ability of individuals born with variations in their physical sex characteristics to participate in these life-altering decisions about genital and gonadal surgeries, which they are currently subjected to, most commonly before the age of two. Um, so I, I do want to address the um, age question that has come up um, a little bit later on in my testimony, if that's okay. Um, first, I want to say, uh, when we talk about these individuals and these surgeries, uh, I think there's a lot of confusion that's been created uh, in part by uh, medical professionals who oppose the bill, and I would like to try and clear some of that up as well. Um, first off, um, the bill applies to all youth born with variations in their physical sex, sex characteristics. Um, whether or not the individual's variation is traditionally considered to be intersex by the medical community and whether or not that individual identifies as intersex. Um, several letters that have been submitted uh, in opposition to the bill seem to suggest that uh, the protection of a broad range of young people is uh, some kind of a drafting error or an oversight, and that's uh, simply not true. Um, children with uh, hypospadias or congenital adrenal hyperplasia or any other variation are subjected to surgeries for the same reasons as children with um, variations that might be considered more classically intersex um, by, you know, physician's definitions or any other definition, uh, which is to make their genitals more, quote, typical, and they also experience the same risks as a result of these early surgeries. Um, so we see no reason why they should be excluded from the bill's protective scope. Second, the surgeries that are covered by the bill are actually um, quite narrow. They're specified. There are just four categories as written. Um, clitoral reductions uh, and other clitoral surgeries, vaginoplasties, gonadectomies, and surgeries that lengthen or rear at the urethra. 
Uh, and it only prohibits these surgeries um, up to the age of 12. Um, so the bill um, is quite narrow, as I said. It wouldn't prohibit circumcision or anything like that, which has been raised in several opposition comments um, that I've read. Um, it also doesn't prevent any medical intervention that is urgently necessary for physical health in infancy or childhood. Um, the language of the bill was developed in consultation with medical professionals um, so as to ensure that it won't limit care that is legitimately necessary for children to thrive. Thank you for your testimony. You have 15 seconds to wrap it up. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll address the age limit since that has come up. Um, most surgeries are currently performed before the age of two, as I mentioned. Um, so the age of 12 was chosen to stop the majority of these harmful surgeries from happening before the individual would be able to um, participate in the decision. Age 12 came about after consultation with child psychologists um, who advised us that uh, age 12 is typically the earliest point at which an individual might start to have the capacity to be able to understand these Thank options and the consequences of these surgeries. Thank you very so, much, Sylvan. Okay. Thank you for Thank your you. testimony. Uh, next witness, please. Hello, welcome to House, House Judiciary. Please turn your computer down. Um, you have one, please identify yourself. You have one minute, 30 seconds. Please proceed. Excellent, thank you. Uh, chairman and members of the committee, my name is uh, Gregory Fox. I'm um, a pediatrician and a pediatric endocrinologist, and I'm representing the Rhode Island chapter in the American Academy of Pediatrics in opposing this bill, 6171. Um, I'll be brief. We have, you know, just two main uh, main points that of, are of concern in this bill. You know, first, you know, first to, to, to frame things. You know, our goal as pediatricians are, you know, to take care of, you know, the whole child and, and the whole person. And, you know, we, and that care, that includes all children, including those with any sort of intersex condition. You know, our, our opposition to this bill, it should in no way be taken as, um, you know, anti-intersex by any means. As an endocrinologist, I've taken care of, you know, many intersex children over the years. Uh, I'm also a general pediatrician, so I take care of, you know, kids with other more routine uh, urologic uh, conditions. And so um, I disagree with the testimony of the, uh, the previous uh, witness in that there are some things that are relatively routine that are um, eliminated in this bill, one being, you know, hypospadias repair, which is, um, you know, just the, the movement of the urethra or, you know, kids, little boys that are born um, with the whole, you know, halfway up their penis. Those surgeries are routinely done in the first couple of years of life, and in my understanding, um, you know, that just makes the surgical complications a lot less. I saw one of these children uh, within the last week or so in my office. So our concern is that this law will, would restrict, you know, relatively routine care um, in Rhode Island. Uh, the second part is, you know, between the disciplinary action civil liability to our urologists, you know, as, uh, you know, representing all pediatricians and pediatric subspecialists, you know, we really respect um, the subspecialists that we have in our state. And having a law like this, particularly one that uh, threatens civil and disciplinary action, really could threaten our ability to retention, retain quality subspecialists within our state. Uh, as well as recruit new ones, um, you know, as, as time passes. So from a, uh, you know, from a workforce standpoint, you know, we're concerned that, you know, we're just creating a situation where, you know, um, we may not be able to um, recruit or retain, you know, the finest uh, in the field here in our state. Um, so we, uh, as, as a Rhode Island chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, we've also been in discussions and are more than happy to um, be part of, um, you know, talking about a, um, a board to look at, um, you know, each individual case. And we work with our partners in genetics and endocrinology mm -hmm. and surgery uh, and ethics as well as the uh, intersex community to make sure that, n you know, nobody has um, a procedure uh, performed, you know, um, that, that they're not going to be happy with, you know, uh, later on in life. Um, so 
Thank you, doctor. Thanks, thank you for your testimony and thank you for taking the time tonight. Any questions of the doctor? Seeing none, uh, thank you again. Next witness, please. Hello, welcome to House Judiciary. Please identify yourself. You have one minute and 30 seconds to testify. You may proceed. Hi, House and uh, Committee. My name is Joanna Georgicus. I'm a current fourth year medical student, incoming physician resident in Rhode Island. I'm testifying today in hopes that you will support HB 6171, a bill authored by Senator Tierra Mack and sponsored by Interact, advocates of intersex, intersex youth and GLAD, LGBTQ legal advocates and defenders. This bill is a human rights bill that will serve to protect bodily autonomy and dignity of our Rhode Island youth. Those who are born with variation in their sex characteristics, often referred to as intersex, are subject to invasive and risky procedures. While surgical recommendations and procedures may be well-intentioned, they are misguided. Irreversible surgeries like clitoral reduction, vaginoplasties, and gonadectomies, which render our children sterile, are not required for these children to lead fulfilling and productive lives like many have believed. In fact, for some of these children, these early surgeries can lead to distress later in life as they can struggle with sexual function and reproduction. And for many of these children, these interventions cause ongoing distress throughout their childhood and adult lives as they must undergo a multitude of surgeries and other interventions in effort to fit them in neatly to a box of which they may or may not identify with. The fear of not fitting into societal norms and physical expectations of sex should not be sufficient motivation for irreversible medical interventions that are not medically indicated. These children do not need to be fixed. The widespread misunderstanding of their bodies does. You have the power to reduce preventable harm done to children born with variations in their physical health and characteristics. I hope that you vote in favor of our Rhode Island youth in support of HB 6171. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Joanna. Any questions of this witness? Seeing none, uh, we'll have the next witness, please. Denise Crooks. Hello, uh, Denise. Are you with us? Yes. Yes, I am. Welcome to House Judiciary. Uh, you have one minute and 30 seconds. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair. My name is Denise Crooks, and I'm speaking in support of House Bill 6171. I'm a clinical social worker, and I work as a therapist. I spend a great deal of time speaking with my patients about their relationships to their bodies, their gender, and sex. These topics are so individual and variable and have a significant impact on mental health. Children with variations in the development of their sex characteristics deserve the opportunity to participate in decisions about the permanent surgeries on their genitals that are covered in this bill. This bill allows parents and children to have time to gather information about surgical options and for a child to assent to these irreversible procedures or not, depending on their own individual relationship to their bodies and their gender. I urge you to vote to pass H6171. Thank you very much, Denise. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll proceed to the next witness. Valerie Smith. Hello, Valerie, are you with us? Yes, I am. Welcome to House Judiciary. You have one minute and 30 seconds to testify. Please proceed. Thank you, I'll try my best to keep the balance <laughs> I will. Um, thank you, House uh, Judiciary Representatives. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak in opposition of H6171. My name is Valerie, and I was born in Seoul, South Korea in May 1988 with classical salt-wasting congenital adrenal hyperplasia, CAH. Shortly following my birth, I was put up for adoption. I would spend the first eight months of my life not just in an orphanage, but also in a South Korean hospital. The reason for my frequent hospital visits as a baby was simply because the physicians at that time in South Korea did not know how to treat and manage my CAH. Because of that, the only way that the hospital could help me was to seek outside consultation from no other than Johns Hopkins Pediatrics in Baltimore, Maryland. It was a recommendation my soon-to-be Johns Hopkins Pediatric Enterologist. The only way to keep me from constantly going into medical crises was for me to be adopted and brought to the United States where they had better resources. Lucky for me, my mom-to-be heard about my CAH while working as a nurse in Johns Hopkins Pediatric Endocrinology Department. Finally, at eight months old, I would be meeting my mom, my dad, and my two older sisters for the first time in December of 1988. 
It was not just a privilege because I was adopted by such loving and nurturing parents here in the United States so quickly after being born, but also because my mom was a nurse and had a medical understanding and respect for my CAH. A few months after my arrival to my new family, I would undergo gentle reconstructive surgery at Johns Hopkins. A single surgery produced a procedure that involved clitoroplasty, vaginoplasty, and labioplasty. Fortunately, I cannot tell you how painful it was or how long my recovery was because I was less than one years old. But what I can tell you is that the surgery was a success, a surgery that I'm glad my parents decided to do when I was such, at, at such a young age. Let me be clear, the surgery I got when I was nine months old does not and will not ever define who I am or my sexuality. What my testimony is meant to do today is shed light that there are successful congenital adrenal hyperplasia and reconstructive surgeries out there. And if this bill were to pass, we will be taking away a safe and effective choice for children and their family with CAH that I am so grateful to have been afforded. I would like to thank you members for this to the committee for listening. I would like to thank my wonderful husband and for his continuous love and support. And I would finally like to thank my parents for having made this difficult decision on behalf of me early on in my life. A difficult decision that should remain only between parents of the child and their physician. A decision I feel is protected under the Parental Rights and Responsibility Act of 1995. Thank you. I'm very much open for questions. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you for sharing your very personal story. Um, any questions of this witness? Thank you again. Uh, next witness, please. Danielle Becker. Hello, Danielle. Are you with us? Hi. Yes, I am. Um, you welcome to House Judiciary. You have one minute and thirty seconds. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Danielle Becker. I'm a constituent of Saunderstown, Rhode Island, um, and I'm calling in support for House Bill 6171 uh, because I believe that we should protect intersex and trans youth at all costs, especially in the current climate, and I think that they have a right to um, health care and us looking out for their well-being, and these surgeries can cause a lot of damage once they've grown up, and there's been a lot of facts that have shown that these are not necessary procedures, so we should be protecting children when we can, and so that's why I support this bill. Well, thank you very much, Danielle, for your testimony. Seeing thank no, you. Seeing no questions, we'll proceed with the next witness. Hello, Nancy, are you with us? Casey. Oh, Casey. Hello, uh, Kate. Casey, yes, sorry. <laughs> No uh, worries. Welcome to House Judiciary. You have one minute and 30 seconds. Please proceed. Thank you so much. I will try my best. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Casey otto I'm a proud previous Rhode Island resident and Brown alum. I majored in neurobiology and worked as a clinical researcher at Rhode Island Hospital in the Department of Emergency Neuroscience, and I'm currently a medical student at Harvard Medical School. The intent and impact of this bill will be to protect vulnerable intersex children, adolescents, and frankly, also adults in Rhode Island. I believe this bill, as currently conscientiously written, will allow intersex people to, ask, to access contextual health care in Rhode Island. Um, I want to clarify that bladder extrophy, cloacial extrophy, and cloatia repairs are not banned, nor would any physician in support of this bill recommend encouraging um, diagnoses that would eventually lead to things like UTIs or any of the renal complications that were mentioned. If individuals have questions about these specific surgeries that um, these physicians are worried will be deprived of individuals in Rhode Island and result in detrimental outcomes, I'm happy to talk about any specific surgeries that individuals have issues with. Um, uh, regarding the alternative option offered by the pediatric urologist at Brown University in order to, to have a, a group of individuals that are informed by um, intersex people and physicians, as a medical student who has tried to engage in meaningful activism, I soon developed fear of speaking up in medicine for things like suggesting asking for my pronouns or clarifying sexual orientation for patients. Sending intersex individuals into a potentially dangerous and triggering space with individuals who have been reluctant for decades to hear out intersex sex people is not a safe option for vulnerable patients trying to secure the rights for themselves and others. 
Clearly, there is a lot of difference of opinion for this bill. However, there are also many physicians who are not currently present who support this bill, whose larger organizations may not give them specific time off to come to every single bill um, like this nationally and speak in opposition to them. Um, I just want to read off uh, some of the physicians that are in support of this bill, um, including... Um, actually, I submitted um, written testimony, yeah. so I won't do that. I okay. just wanted to... Could I speak to one point about how these um, surgeries that we're critiquing are outdated? Um, because they are not. Um, the surgeries that um, many physicians are speaking out against um, were written about as recently as 2017. Um, additionally, the AMA came to their decision after medical students had requested from them um, to look into this ethical issue, um, after which time physicians asked for expert opinion to be taken into consideration. So the physicians listened to the same pediatric urologists who are speaking today, who speak at various meetings, cited 22 papers, and then um, decided not to amend their ethical um, considerations. So so it wasn't, yeah, okay, that's all. Thank you so much. Um, oh, also, Thank you very uh, yeah. much. Your, your time is up, Casey. I'm sorry. Um, no, any, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any um, questions of this witness? Seeing none, next witness, please.